Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I'm here with my January wrap-up. The first book I finished in 2020 was Green Glass House by Kate Milford. This is the first book in, I think, a series. And we follow a young boy, Milo, and his parents run a, a hotel or an inn that is pretty much exclusively an inn for smugglers. Then one Christmas break, uh, a time when normally they don't have any guests, strange people, uh, stranger than usual, start showing up at the inn, and Milo starts to think that they're all connected somehow, or that they're all looking for the same thing, or trying to find out the same thing. So then Milo and his new friend Medi decide that they're going to be the ones to get to the bottom of this. I really liked Milo and Medi as characters and their friendship, um, and I think there were so many wonderful things explored in this book about adoption and family and home and belonging, um, because Milo is adopted, and I believe he is Chinese, and his family are not. And so you see the way he has to deal with people's uh, assumptions or questions or the way that they feel like they're allowed to make judgments about him and his family. I feel like this book was a really thoughtful portrayal of adoption. Um, I can't speak to that personally, but that's the way it seemed to me at least. And I really like the way that Milo loves his family, um, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have questions about his birth parents. And his family consistently show him and tell him that that's all right and that they know that he still loves them and that it's normal to have questions and I just really really like that. I really like the mystery. Um, there were also these like stories that were kind of sprinkled throughout the book that I really enjoyed overall aside from this scene of like animal sacrifice that felt super out of place um, but besides that I really liked the atmosphere that they lent. And I also loved the sort of imagination like role-playing game that Milo and Medi start playing. Um, it feels a tiny bit like Dungeons and Dragons although that's coming from somebody who has never played but who wants to play. Um, and at first I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about that because I wasn't sure how that would translate to a novel, but I really enjoyed it and I really liked the way that Milo kind of used his alter ego as a way to be more confident and to use different skills and to, like him and Medi kind of getting information out of people. Um, I just really liked that. I thought it was used in such a creative and fun way. Some of the developments really took me by surprise and I gave Green Glass House four stars. Next I listened to The Deal of a Lifetime by Frederick Backman and I listened to the audiobook which was narrated by Santino Fontana. Um, and that's kind of funny because that's basically the reason that I chose this as my first Frederick Backman. Um, I, I got this from my library and I got the email saying that they had automatically checked the, the audiobook out to me and I was like, why did I request this one? And then I remembered that the audiobook narrator was Santino Fontana, whom I love. So that was basically the reason. Um, and this is a really, really short story. I think the audiobook is only like an hour or something, um, maybe a little more. And for that reason, I can't really say too much what it's about. But basically, um, we follow this really unlikable main character who gets the opportunity uh, to make a decision that will change his life forever. And the story is really about um, family and sacrifice and love and doing the right thing versus doing what is easy or what is best for you. I really liked the musings on home and family and place. And this was a really interesting experience for me. Um, audiobook wise, I think Santino Fontana did a good job. I think kind of he did the best with what he could because because the story is so short, because the main character is supposed to be so incredibly unlikable. Um, I think the story and the character kind of ended up feeling like one note, but I do think that was the point of the story, but it did make it not as fun to listen to, I think. Like, we do see some character development, but it wasn't quite enough, um, and I think the concept for the story was good, but I don't think it was long enough to really explore that. But on the other hand, one of the things I did like about it is that it was short, and it was just this really quick snippet of this really interesting story. Um, so this was like a really mixed bag for me. I did really like the ending. I think it would have been more effective if I had enjoyed the rest of the story and the character development more, but I did still like it. Um, I gave it 3.5 stars and I definitely want to read more from Frederick Backman. Next I finished Maribel and the Book of Fate by Tracy Barrett. This is a story about our main character Maribel um, and her twin brother. Marco gets kidnapped on the twin's birthday and Maribel decides that she's going to be the one to rescue him and to bring him back to the kingdom um, because Marco is also like this prophesied chosen one. So not only does she want to rescue her brother, but the whole kingdom is in an uproar because basically their golden boy has disappeared. Um, and Maribel has grown up as definitely not the favorite. Um, everyone treats her pretty badly, including her family. They don't really pay much attention to her, but she really loves her brother and she decides that she has to be the one to rescue him. I really liked the idea of all of these fairy tale tropes being explored. Um, like the Book of Fate is also kind of an interesting concept because it really guides these characters' lives and throughout the book you're kind of wondering um, how much of that is justified and how much isn't. Uh, the magic could be kind of interesting, and I was drawn to this like underdog kind of story. But unfortunately, I just didn't really click with this book. Um, I found it pretty boring, honestly, and the journey that Maribel takes is pretty repetitive and episodic. Um, like her and her friends were just kind of like, they'd run into an obstacle and they'd spend a few chapters getting away from it and then they would keep going, they'd run into another obstacle, spend a few chapters getting away from it, and I know that's like a very common um, plotline, but 
I didn't really connect with the characters. I didn't think the setting was that unique. So this ended up just being kind of middle of the road for me. I thought it was fine. Um, I wouldn't like not recommend it to people, but I gave this book three stars and I think there are much better middle grade fantasies out there personally. Well, I do want to mention I really really liked some of the ending and the way that was resolved. So that was nice. Next I finished Violence and Virtue, Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith Slaying Holofernes by Eve Strassman Flanzer. And thank you so much to my wonderful friend Yvette for giving this to me. She knows that I am really really interested in Artemisia Gentileschi, which by the way I might have been saying that wrong before, although it's not entirely my fault because it seems like there are a lot of different ways to pronounce her name. Uh, but moving on, um, this is a kind of deep dive on Gentileschi's painting of Judith Slaying Holofernes um, and really analyzing that one painting in depth and I really really enjoyed this. Um, the art first off is just stunning, like the detail that you get to see in these like full color illustrations is absolutely wonderful. Um, I really loved the analysis of like the multiple versions she did of the painting. Um, so she painted several that were on this theme, but also with our modern technology we can see like the underlying sketches of where Artemisia might have changed um, change the position of figures or certain things like that, which I just found fascinating, and the possible interpretations for why she might have changed something. I love the way this book examined Artemisia's impact um, on art, and possibly one of my favorite parts is the way that it looked at um, contemporary reactions to her paintings, which a lot of them boiled down to like, well yes, we know that in the story a man gets beheaded, but goodness gracious, Judith is so messy and unfeminine. Like, look at all that blood, that's just horrifying. Um, because Artemisia was really the first painter, I think, or one of the first, to paint that scene in a way that was really raw and upsetting and realistic. And I think it's no coincidence that she was also one of the first women, if not the first woman, to paint that scene. The only thing I felt like was really an omission from this booklet, and the reason I gave it four stars instead of five, is because it doesn't talk at all about something that I consider a pretty important aspect of this painting, and that is the fact that after Artemisia was raped by her tutor, she actually painted Holofernes, um, so the figure being beheaded, with the face of her rapist. And I think that is a really important thing to note. I don't know why the author chose not to focus on that. Um, it might have been because she didn't want to reduce Artemisia's work to what happened to her, which I could understand, but she didn't really say that. She just kind of glossed over this almost entirely. Like she mentioned it in half a sentence and then moved on. Um, and I just think that was kind of odd because that is a huge component of this painting's makeup. And so to not talk about that I thought was kind of a little weird. Like look at that painting. She painted that man with the face of the man who raped her, and I just don't see how you wouldn't discuss that, or at least talk about why you're not discussing it. Other than that, I thought this was fantastic, and I would highly, highly recommend this work if you are at all interested in Artemisia, um, or painting, or feminism, or any of a number of topics. Next I finished the first of three uh, February new releases that are going to be in this wrap-up, which is pretty unusual for me, um, and that is Foul is Fair by Hannah Kappen. Uh, this is a contemporary retelling of Macbeth, in which our main character Jade is sexually assaulted or gang raped at a party, and she decides to take her revenge by killing the boys who did this to her. And like I said, this is all framed as kind of a Macbeth retelling or reimagining. The cast is really diverse, and I think in some ways that was explored in a really thoughtful way. Our main character Jade is Indian, and although that's not a huge focus of the story. Um, it is nice to see that. And one of Jade's best friends is a trans girl, and I think that was explored in a really thoughtful way, in a way that acknowledged the hardships she had gone through um, without reducing her character to just being queer pain, essentially. And every once in a while there were some insightful or interesting or thoughtful things said about sexism and rape culture and the dangers that women have to face every day. Um, unfortunately those were pretty few and far between, but occasionally they were there. Um, and last for the things I enjoyed is I think the concept of this book could have been really good. Unfortunately, uh, nothing else about it really was to me. I absolutely despised the writing style in this book. Like I have rarely been so infuriated by how pretentious and nonsensical some a writing style was. Um, for one thing it's first person present tense, which is my least favorite combination ever, but even aside from that, like I could overlook that if the rest of the writing was good, and it just wasn't. It was so like stream of consciousness and like using metaphors and comparisons that made absolutely no sense. Like not even in a poetic kind of way, like they made absolutely no sense like as combinations of words. Like the dialogue was so ridiculous sounding, like no human being in the world has ever spoken like any of these characters, and all of them talked like this. I mean obviously writing style is incredibly based on personal preference, so you might not have the same problems with it. I actually saw a lot of reviews from people who loved the writing for this, who thought it was really fresh and creative and um, like the voice was really strong, which is great. I couldn't stand it. Also, every single character in this book was just a cardboard cutout. Um, like nobody had any development or personality or anything. Like Jade has a few best friends and there were two of them in particular where like 
I still could not tell you which was which like near the end of this book like they were just so interchangeable and because the characters were so flat like this book just ended up feeling like a concept um like I mentioned I did think the concept had potential unfortunately that's what this book felt like to me is like it was just an idea um with no real characters to give it any life another thing I hated about this book and possibly the thing that enraged me the most is that for something that is supposed to be a feminist retelling this book is incredibly misogynistic like the internalized sexism that these girls have including the main characters was just insufferable to me like basically if you are not jade or one of her three best friends you're a dumb slut who deserves what's coming to you basically like the complete lack of sympathy that jade felt for other girls who had been raped was just incredibly offensive to me like right after um she's assaulted she goes to the hospital and there's like a requirement that um she be visited by a rape counselor and the way that jade acted was like if somebody chooses to pursue that route um they are weak and i hated that implication um like jade was just so incredibly judgmental of all other women like part of her like persona that she puts on to like go undercover to seduce and then murder these boys is dressing up like super slutty and whatever and especially considering that she's doing that like the fact that she looks down on other girls who uh who wear short skirts or who like carry themselves a certain way or present themselves a certain way was just incredibly upsetting to me also i think as a retelling this book just really really failed because i truly don't know who this book is for um because if you like shakespeare and if you like macbeth i i don't know what you're going to get from this because the elements from the retelling felt so surface level and shallow like if i have to hear jade's friend group referred to as a coven one more time i will throw my book at the wall <laughs> like that's how irritated i got because like that was the only the only element of the retelling that really came through is like certain words or like character names if you're looking for a clever take on macbeth this is not it but I also think that Hannah Kappen leaned way too far into the retelling because it made character motivations make absolutely no sense. Like there were so many times where characters would make decisions or something would happen in the plot and the only reason it happened is because it happened in the original play. Like the way we had set up these characters or this story, there was no damn reason for this to happen except that we knew it had to because it's based on another story. The ending was like incredibly anticlimactic and disappointing like i don't know what i was hoping for to happen but it was not this like we got to the end and i was basically like oh okay i guess we're done so yeah originally i gave fellas fair 2.5 stars because i think there were like glimmers of what could have been a great book but honestly i hated every second of this and this is one of the only times i regret that i don't rate purely based on my like enjoyment or personal experience with the book because i would give this book like one star in a heartbeat but I don't know maybe it's somewhere in the middle like 1.75 stars or something i might change it on goodreads because i hated every second of this the next book i finished was holy troublemakers and unconventional saints by Denine acres and i talked about this book in my haul um but basically this is a non-fiction book about people from a wide variety of religious and spiritual backgrounds she wanted to create a book that told readers especially young kids um that being a religious or spiritual person means sometimes you have to break the rules it means making trouble and standing up against what the general way of thinking is or what the law is or what tradition says you're supposed to do so she put this book together uh, in order to fill that need and i really loved this i thought this is such an important project like that's such an important thing to teach kids i absolutely loved the way this book was put together the art is absolutely stunning there's a wide variety of artists featured and something that i really love is that the individual artists are credited right next to the picture so you don't have to flip to the back of the book in order to find out who painted or who drew something uh, like for example the one i just showed is of caitlin curtis um, and the illustration is by Chief Ladybird. There's a lot of different religions and denominations that are discussed or that are included. I didn't count the exact numbers, but I think there probably are uh, more from Christian denominations than from other religions. And I think part of the reason for that is the reason that Deneen Akers created this book is because she specifically was noticing that with um, with Christian nonfiction books intended for children, there was a real lack of this kind of book um, that talked about, you know, breaking rules and making trouble, and especially that included um, people of other faiths and religions and spiritualities. So I think because um, the angle she was coming at it from was based in the lack in Christian publishing, I think it makes sense that there probably are more Christian uh, figures in this book, but do keep that in mind. I believe that she and her publishing company are currently working on a second volume, and I imagine that there's going to be even more variety included in that one. As for the writing itself, I thought it was really thoughtful. It definitely kept in mind the target audience of children, I think, without sugarcoating things too much. I also like the way that she was really intentional with the language that she used when discussing especially marginalized groups. Um, there's a note at the beginning where she, for example, she talks about why she says um, enslaved person versus slave, which is basically that um, to call somebody a slave almost like implicitly 
um, makes the assumption that it is possible for a human being to be owned by another, and that is not true. Like I said, I really appreciated the variety of figures in this book, um, some of whom are very well known, but who we haven't really talked about how um, radical they were, uh, and some of them are figures who I had never heard of or who I had heard very little about. So I just think this is such an important project. Um, I think the execution was beautiful. The like actual construction of this book is also gorgeous. It's got like a ribbon bookmark and that, like I said, I already gushed about the illustrations. Um, but I give this book five stars and I'm really, really excited that a book like this exists. Next I finished Foundry Side by Robert Jackson Bennett. This is the first book in a fantasy series and it's set in a land that is somewhat inspired by um, a fantasy version of Italy, but not quite. And the magic system in this world is called scribing. Basically what that means is that you carve symbols on objects that basically lie to those objects about reality. So if you carve something on the wheels of a cart, for example, that makes the cart think that uh, it's been rolling down a hill for 10 minutes, it's going to go really fast, that kind of thing. And in this world we follow our main character Sanchia, and she is a thief, and at the beginning of the book um, she gets caught up in this job that turns out to be a lot bigger and more dangerous than she thought it was. She comes across something that could change the entirety of the world as she knows it, um, it could change their magic, it could change the politics of the city forever, and she doesn't really know what to do about it, uh, but of course she gets involved. And then the rest of the book is about the consequences of what she found um, and of like putting together this other heist. And I ended up really enjoying this. Um, the beginning was a little slow for me because I think Robert Jackson Bennett is a really good writer, but something about his writing style was just really, really slow for me to get through. So for the first chunk of this book, I was kind of struggling a little bit. Um, and also, which I saw my friend Huck when she was talking about this book, she mentioned that the character development is really more towards the middle and the end of the book. Um, at the beginning, you're just kind of dropped into this world and figuring out how the magic and the setting and everything works. And it's more about the heist than actually getting to know the characters who are involved in the heist. Um, and obviously I'm a character focused reader, so that was a little rough for me but I ended up really getting so attached to all of these characters, like even ones that I never thought I would care about, um, who were introduced as like kind of uh, stereotypes or archetypes, even the ones that were introduced that way, um, you ended up finding out that there was so much more to them than that, which I really appreciated. I also thought the setting was really interesting, although I think actually knowing um, a little bit about Italian culture and history actually hindered my understanding of the book a little bit. Like for example, for the first like 60 or 70 pages of the, of the book, you hear something referred to that's called the campo, and that's an actual word in Italian, and it means like countryside or field basically. So I was assuming that the region they were describing as the campo was like the poor people's area, or like where the laborers or the workers lived. And it's actually the opposite, is where the rich people lived, which I found super confusing. Um, there were a few times like that where like Robert Jackson Bennett would like use an Italian word or something that was almost a real Italian word, but use it to mean something completely different. So I was a little confused by that. I did end up really enjoying the setting and I also loved the magic system. Um, that was actually one of my favorite parts of this book is just when we would have examples or explanations or like the backstory of how this magic works. I found that so much more interesting than the heist, to be honest. And I think also hearing this book talked about so much, because this is like a really popular book on booktube, um, I think that actually helped me in this case because everybody talked about how confusing the magic system is. Basically, I think everybody's reviews like prepared me for it being really complicated so that by the time I actually read the book, I'm like, oh, okay, this wasn't as bad as I was expecting. Like I was picturing like that geometry meme and it was not that bad. Um, so I really enjoyed the magic system. I also really liked the plot, which was actually connected quite a bit to the magic system. So that makes sense. And I really enjoyed the way this magic um, explored personality or personhood, uh, the way that it could give inanimate objects like personalities and thoughts. I just really liked that. It was kind of similar to like the exploration of AI. The only things I wasn't as much of a fan of is there was a romance in this book that felt pretty underdeveloped. I do think there's potential for that to be better developed in future books, so that wasn't a huge deal. The antagonist or multiple antagonists, um, there were some implications with those that I really, really didn't like. I mentioned those uh, in more spoilery detail in my Goodreads review, so I will link that down below if you want to see it. But overall, I really, really enjoyed Foundryside, and I gave it four stars. The next book I finished was Oversea Under Stone, uh, the first book in the Dark is Rising sequence by Susan Cooper. This was a buddy read with my friend Todd from Todd the Librarian. Um, and the funny thing about this series is I am pretty sure I read the entire thing years and years and years ago when I was really young. And I remember like absolutely nothing about the series except that it's like vaguely Welsh and like King Arthur inspired. And I think I liked it. <laughs> that was really the only thing I remembered. Um, although I don't actually remember if I read the first book because it's kind of a prequel. And basically what happens is we follow these three uh, children who are staying in Cornwall for a while with their parents. Um, and they come across an object that basically 
sets them off on this quest and they find out that now that they have found this object they are sort of irrevocably bound up in this fight between good and evil um, that has basically been centered around King Arthur and like his Knights of the Round Table and this has been like this fight has been going on for like hundreds or thousands of years at this point and they have to protect uh, these objects or this information from falling into the hands of the dark and the premise it sounds kind of generic but for some reason I just really really enjoyed this um, I really liked the atmosphere of this book and of the setting like this wild beauty of Cornwall and of the moors kind of where they're staying I think it's moors I don't know if you would use that word in Cornwall but we're gonna say it's moors I really liked um, the way that the legends and the stories and the folklore of King Arthur was worked into this story I am realizing that I like King Arthur retellings more than I thought, but I'm still pretty picky with them. I thought the way it was worked into this story was really well done. I also liked some of the humor. Initially, I was not the biggest fan of the three kids, the three main characters, Barney, Jane, and Simon, I think are their names. Like, it seemed like all they were doing was, like, fighting and, like, being mean to each other. But on the other hand, siblings, you know, sometimes that happens. Uh, but I ended up really liking them and their involvement in this story and in this kind of quest or series of quests. Now another thing I was kind of afraid of um, is that this was going to be a series that really didn't age well. I forget when it was written but it was like a few decades ago at this point but it didn't end up being as bad as I was worried about. Um, I mean you know for example there's a couple of times where the kids play at being natives and they say some things that are you know definitely we wouldn't say today and I think at one point one of the bad guys dresses up in brown face for a festival which is also not great but overall the general like outdated language and stuff was not as bad as I was expecting, which, you know, take that as you will. So I've heard from a few people who tried to reread this series recently that they really didn't enjoy it, so maybe the later books I won't like as much, but this one at least I had a pretty good time reading. Um, I ended up giving it four stars. The next book is one that I finally finished after like six months of reading little bits of it off and on, uh, and that is Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton. This is a bind-up that has two essay collections of his, which are Heretics and Orthodoxy. Um, Heretics I read last year. And this was a pretty mixed reading experience. Um, I feel like one of the best ways to talk about my feelings on this collection is to kind of compare it to what I said about Heretics last year, which is an essay collection that I really enjoyed. Um, that one covered a wide range of topics and I think it would appeal to a wide range of readers, and Chesterton is just an amazingly clever and interesting and funny writer. And with Orthodoxy, it's for a much narrower range of people, which makes sense because he basically wrote Orthodoxy in answer to a challenge somebody made where basically they were like, well, why should I listen to anything you say if you don't tell me like what you think about these things that you were like chastising us for in Heretics? Um, and so Chesterton wrote this as an answer to a challenge. And specifically, Orthodoxy is about Chesterton's own beliefs and his perspective on Christianity and why he became Christian. And so for that reason, I think this is really only going to be interesting to people who are specifically interested in Christianity. I did enjoy some of this. I had some issues with it too. This is like a very qualified recommendation because there are some parts of this that I absolutely loved that I thought were so thoughtful and so interesting and so well written. And there are other parts where you can really see Chesterton's biases. And on the one hand that makes sense because he says he like says in a preface to this book that like it's only intended as an explanation of his personal feelings. It's not a work of apologetics or like he's not trying to persuade people of things or anything. Like he's just talking about why he came to believe what he did and some other kind of like connected philosophical discussions. Um, so on the one hand it makes sense that it would be kind of more personal like that, but there were still some places that were, you know, more uncomfortable to read because it's like there's places where there's this implication that like this is why he came to believe the thing that was like most right out of all of them and stuff like that. So like I said, um, I am glad I read it. There are some parts of this I could see myself coming back to that I really enjoyed and of course Chesterton is a fantastic writer as always, um, but just keep in mind the different focus of this collection and the fact that his biases do come through in parts of this if you are considering picking this up. The next book I finished was Poison by Bridget Zinn and this is a fantasy book for our main character Kira and she is a potion apprentice I think um, but she is now on the run because she tried to assassinate the princess of her kingdom and we're kind of hinted at that she had a very specific reason for doing this um, and she is in fact going to try and kill the princess again even though the princess is her best friend and we get these flashbacks of them being great friends and growing up together. So for most of this book um, she's trying to find the princess and as this is going on she kind of meets some friends or companions along the way and as the reader we're also slowly starting to learn more about um, Kira's backstory and why she exactly tried to kill the princess and this book was pretty cute. Um, I really love Rosie the pig. There's this little tiny pig named Rosie who is like the cutest thing and she was honestly one of my favorite characters. Um, Kira herself I don't think was super well developed. Most of the main characters weren't really and I also think the reason that we find out for why Kira did what she did was pretty unconvincing to me. 
um, so I didn't really like that. There's also a romance that felt kind of underdeveloped, but I did really like um, the resolution of some of the conflict or the mystery, and I also really liked some of the scenes of potion making. Um, so overall I gave this book three stars. The next book I finished was actually a play, and that is The Revolutionist by Lauren Gunderson, and you guys might remember I read two Lauren Gunderson plays recently, and one of the main complaints I had was that even though I really enjoyed them, I really didn't like the ending. So I was hoping to find a Lauren Gunderson play that really, really stuck the landing, and this one absolutely did. I ended up giving this play five stars. I thought it was fantastic. Um, this might be like one of my new like top 10 favorite plays. This is a comedy where we follow four women, um, and it's set during the Reign of Terror. And this play tells you at the very beginning, it's like, this is a comedy that ends on the scaffold. But remember, it's a comedy. And I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I have read many plays that try to do the balancing comedy and drama thing, that have done it really badly. And this one did it, I think, really, really well. Um, there's There are moments of real emotional connection to these characters and to this play while still being just absolutely hilarious. Like the dialogue in this play is so, so funny. Um, there are so many great lines here. And I really love the fact that out of these four main female characters, or the whole cast is these four women, all of them are really strong roles. All of them are fantastic characters. I think the social commentary of this, of this play is fantastic. One of the characters is sort of a composite character um, of several different black women who were revolutionaries around this time who led uh, slave uprisings or revolts. I think that part of the play and the conflict and that character was handled really thoughtfully. Um, this play has a lot of really wonderful things to say about storytelling and the power of words and bravery and what bravery means and how that looks and if storytelling or words themselves are a form of bravery. I also really loved the ending. Um, the ending has a trope that I almost never like, and this play I think is one of the best ways I have ever seen it done. This was fantastic. I'm thinking of doing like a whole separate video on this play because I loved it so much. Um, definitely highly recommended. The next book I finished is This Time Will Be Different by Misa Sugiera. We follow our main character CJ, um, and she is Japanese American, and her family has owned this flower shop. Um, for several generations before this, and then during the Japanese internment, um, they were forced to sell it at pennies on the dollar to a white family, and eventually they were finally able to buy it back, at great cost, of course, but now it looks like they're going to have to close it down because it's losing business. And CJ is a character who, she doesn't really know what she wants to do with her life. Um, her mom is incredibly driven and very work focused and she kind of expects the same thing from her daughter, but CJ hasn't really figured out what she wants to do yet. Um, she's really happiest when she's working in the flower shop, which is a complete surprise to her if she didn't think she would enjoy it. And then on top of all of her uh, stress about the future, her mother decides that she's going to sell the flower shop to the white family who originally um, basically cheated her grandparents, and CJ is horrified. Her aunt, who is currently running the shop, is horrified, and it's about what CJ tries to do to fight back against this, and there's some other kind of um, more interpersonal conflicts going on as well, with romance and friendships and some things at school and all of that. First off, I really enjoyed the writing, um, and I really liked how throughout the book there were these kind of chunks that were broken up that were almost told in, like, essay format. I think that was a really clever way of giving us backstory on certain characters or on the history of CJ's family. And I also really loved the part of the plot that focused on uh, saving the flower shop and um, on activism because she starts, there's this movement that CJ helps start at her school. She starts standing up for what she believes in and for what is right, and there's just a lot about like social justice and activism in this book that I thought was really wonderfully handled. Um, and I also really liked the flower shop itself, like the scenes in the shop, and um, her and her aunt's relationship was super interesting. I think some of the family relationships in this book were just really good, and the flower shop was just like a really fun environment, and I enjoyed um, the bits that we learned about why CJ and her aunt enjoy flowers and like the language of flowers and all of that. I did have quite a few issues with it though. For one thing is I think the romance was pretty underdeveloped. Like, the guy she ends up with is nice and I really like him and I think he could have been a great character, but we didn't really spend a lot of time on them interacting so that by the time by the time CJ realized that she did have feelings for him I was kind of like, oh, why? It just felt like that wasn't given enough time. Um, and that was actually a complaint I have with this book overall is the subplots and the things that got page space felt pretty uneven to me. Um, it wasn't exactly a pacing issue because I rarely care about pacing. Recently I thought there were some things that were given a lot of page time and some things that weren't given nearly enough, like CJ being somebody who like doesn't believe in love and this boy has to like try and convince her that love is real. Like compared to the social justice subplot and trying to save the flower shop, I was not really interested in that. Um, and maybe if there had been better development for this boy in their relationship, I might have enjoyed that more, but as it was, I was just kind of like, can we get back to the part I actually care about? Also, this book felt like kind of long, and again, this is another one that felt sort of repetitive, um, because it felt like we were just killing time until certain other things happened. Like, honestly, I have no idea what the time span for the events of this book was, and some of this repetition makes sense because 
CJ, like, really one of the only things she cares about is going to the flower shop. So it's like she'd go to the flower shop and work, and she'd come home. She'd fight with her mom. She'd go to school. We'd hear about that a little bit. Then she'd go back to the flower shop. She'd come home. She'd fight with her mom. She'd go to school, like, <laughs> over and over. So I ended up giving this book 3.5 stars. Um, I really, really liked the actual main story of the flower shop and CJ's activism. While well, the other stuff I talked about kind of detracted from this book for me, especially things like the romantic subplot that I just didn't care about as much. The next book I finished was Night Spinner by Addie Thorley. This is another February new release and I actually won this one in a Goodreads giveaway which was really exciting. It's like a winter fantasy retelling of The Hunchback of Notre Dame and this is another kind of middle of the road book for me unfortunately. So our main character is Enabish and um, she has this night spinning magic, as you can probably guess from the title. There was this tragedy where she lost control of her magic and a bunch of people died. She was, I think, originally in the Empire's army. I think she might have originally been going to be executed or something else terrible would have happened to her, but her sister steps in and has her banished to this monastery instead where she can't hurt anybody. And then some things happen where Endovish gets into trouble again and her sister makes her this deal where in exchange for her getting her back on the Emperor's good side, um, she will catch and bring back this rebel who has been causing trouble for the uh, the Empire's troops and everything because um, they're in the middle of a war, I think. I thought the relationship dynamics between Enabish and Temujin and Enabish and her sister Goa, I thought those could be really interesting sometimes. I also liked some aspects of the setting. Um, I'm pretty sure this is inspired by Mongolia, but I like didn't hear anything about that in the marketing, which I think is kind of odd. But overall, I just was really bored by this book. Um, I didn't really care about the story and like not a lot happens and the stuff that does happen takes a long time to start happening. Um, like the whole having to uh, having to hunt down Temujin, the rebel, that doesn't happen until, is it like a hundred pages in? Yeah, like the actual deal doesn't happen until like a quarter of the way through this book at page 100, which considering how slow and boring the, uh, this book was, I think that's too long to wait for the main story to start. I also really hated her best friend, Sarek. He was just super irritating and he's like a great example of this type of character that I very rarely care about. And that is like the main character's best friend that's implied there might also be some romantic undertones but the only reason they exist is to make the character make certain decisions for the sake of the plot. <laughs> um, like they get like no personality, no real interesting development, and that's how I felt about Sarek. I also didn't care about the magic very much. Um, I think that was kind of underdeveloped and underexplained. Although on the other hand, I actually didn't like any of the scenes with magic in them. I thought they were really boring and I didn't care about them, so maybe I wouldn't have necessarily wanted more explanation for the magic. And also the ending of this book. I didn't hate it, but weirdly enough, I think I would have hated it if I had cared more about the rest of the story. <laughs> um, so make of that what you will, but yeah, I was pretty disappointed in this book. I gave it three stars. Next, I finished The Lost Frost Girl by Amy Wilson. We follow a young girl named Owl. She has just grown up with her mother, and her mother has never really told her anything about her father, but Owl grew up hearing fairy tales and stories, and one day she realizes that some of those stories are actually true, um, and that she is in fact the daughter of Jack Frost. And the book is about her trying to find her father and what this means and how it starts affecting um, her, you know, ordinary life. And then she starts to uncover something that it seems like the other fae um, in in this world who are kind of like, some of them are nature spirits and some of them are like personifications of seasons and things like that. She finds out that some of them might be trying to sabotage Jack Frost or get him banished. And while all of this supernatural conflict is happening, um, her best friend is going through a really hard time at home. So Al is worried about her, but she also doesn't know how much she can tell her about what is going on with you know, her father being Jack Frost and all of this like magical conflict that is happening. Um, and that is one of my favorite things about this book is the way that there was that magical conflict and the mundane conflict and they both felt important. They felt really balanced in this book and it felt like they were pretty realistically handled. I really liked the folklore and the magic and um, I don't know how to describe it, basically the lore of this world. I feel like this book did a great job of balancing creative interpretations of some of these nature spirits or characters that we know of. Like Jack Frost is obviously a pretty well-known um, character in folklore and I think Amy Wilson did a wonderful job of putting her own spin on that story and on all of these other stories while also keeping them true to what feels like the core of who they are. And I also loved the writing and the main character. Um, Owl is just so clever and funny. I really enjoyed her. Despite this book being a fantasy, um, I guess a contemporary fantasy, uh, Owl is just a very, she was very believable in all of this that was going on. She's also just a really easy character to love, I think, to get along with. Um, and I think part of that is the writing. I think this is first person and it might actually be 
present tense. It is, which I re remember being remarkable because as I mentioned earlier, that's generally my least favorite combination, um, but I think it was done really well in this book. Like Al's voice is just very unique and fun and she takes things seriously when they need to be, but she's also a kid, you know, she wants to have a good time. Um, I just ended up really enjoying this book. I can't wait to read everything else Amy Wilson has written and I gave The Lost Frost Girl 4.5 stars. The next book I finished was The Swords of Summer by Rick Riordan. This is the first book in the Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard series. I was actually fortunate enough to be a guest co-host for Demigods Anonymous. Um, I'm pretty sure by the time this goes up we will have already done that live show so I will link that down below. We're so excited to have a chance to be a part of this and to talk about the book with everybody. Um, the book itself though unfortunately I was pretty disappointed in. It did barely scrape a three stars for me. I really loved Percy Jackson and I really loved the Heroes of Olympus series. So apparently um, a lot of people didn't really like this one because they felt like it was too similar to Percy Jackson, like especially Magnus, the main character, felt too much like Percy. And I actually <laughs> disagree. I think I would have enjoyed this book a lot more if Magnus had been more of a copy of Percy or of Jason, which I know a lot of people don't like Jason. I really enjoyed Jason as a main character. Um, but Magnus, I just really, really didn't like him for the majority of this book. And a big part of why it was hard to connect to Magnus is that for like 75% of this book, it felt like he didn't care about anything that was happening. Like characters would explain the world to him or would tell him about a plot thing or he would find out something about this mystery they're trying to solve. And his reaction would basically be like, fine, whatever, I don't care. And even though sometimes that was understandable given his circumstances, like Magnus, um, I realize I haven't told you anything about what this book is about. Magnus Chase, he is homeless, he's living on the streets, until one day he finds out that he is the son of a Norse god, and along the way he realizes that it's up to him and a couple of his friends to try and stop Ragnarok from happening, which is basically the apocalypse or the end of the world. So because of Magnus's really hard life, he also lost his mom in addition to being homeless and having all of these other bad things happen to him, so it makes sense why he wouldn't be like super interested or invested in some of this other stuff that was happening. But it got to a point where even when it felt like he should have been caring, he wasn't caring. And it's like, if your main character doesn't even care about this book, why should I, as the reader, care about this book? Eventually I did start liking him more when he started taking a more active role in wanting to do stuff in the story. Um, so that so eventually it got better, but it was just really hard to make myself care about the story when the protagonist didn't even care. I also really hated the humor in this book. Like Rick Riordan, I think is a funny writer. I really enjoy the humor in Percy Jackson and in the Heroes of Olympus books. This one did not work for me. Like how many times can we do the same joke format of a character using a Norse word that Magnus doesn't understand and Magnus repeats a similar sounding word back to him that's a funny word or a silly word and like that's it that's the joke and it's like I remember that happening in Percy Jackson a few times but there were other sources of humor I have read um, other Rick Riordan books relatively recently and I really liked the humor in those so I don't think it's just that I don't like his humor anymore like honestly this one felt different to me I also really didn't like the plot in general this book just felt like an extended fetch quest and I recognize, you know, that in some of the other Rick Riordan books that's kind of a similar setup, but in those cases I liked the characters a lot more and I think, I don't know, there was something about the story that was more engaging to me. Everything just felt like an unnecessary detour and I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion or not, but I think Rick Riordan should stick to writing shorter books because <laughs> this one was like 500 pages and it felt even longer and like so much of this was filler. It had absolutely no effect on what happened in this book and it just really irritated me because that kind of thing kept happening where it's like, this is obviously just a side quest that is here to take up more time and to make the book last longer and to delay the actual climax of the story. And I really didn't like that. Um, I recognize that some of it is probably going to come up in later books, but it happened a lot. Like a lot of the events of this book kind of felt like they were just there to waste time and I didn't like that. So after all of those things I didn't like, why did I give it three stars? Um, because there were some things I think were really well done in this book. Like we meet a character named Samira. She's a side character who is Muslim and she's also one of the Valkyries and I just really really liked her character. She was super interesting to me. Um, I wish we could have gotten to see more of her honestly, uh, but she was great. And I also really loved some of the scenes with Magnus and actually interacting directly with some of the Norse gods. Like there were a few in particular that I'm thinking of that I just thought the dialogue and the atmosphere and just everything about those scenes I thought was so so strong. And like I said, I did actually like some things about the ending, which is one of the things that saved this book for me. And finally, the last book I finished in January was Yes, No, Maybe So by Becky Albertalli and Aisha Saeed. And this is the final new release that comes out in February that I read in January. And this is a contemporary novel and it's dual perspective. We follow two main characters. One of them is a girl named Maya um, and she is Muslim and one of them is a boy named Jamie and he is Jewish. And both of those things are own voices with representation um, and they sort of, for various reasons, get roped into doing door-to-door -door canvassing for a special election that is happening in 
uh, in their town. I'm pretty sure this takes place in Georgia. Both of them have things going on at home that are really upsetting. My parents are actually separating for a while and she doesn't know if they're going to get divorced or get back together or what's happening. Um, Jamie has what's not, what seems like really uh, intense social anxiety or at the very least he has a real hard time um, public doing public speaking and talking in front of people and he is getting ready to give the speech at his sister's bat mitzvah which he's incredibly stressed about and so the two of them end up canvassing together and they start spending more time together and become friends and start to maybe have feelings for each other that are also romantic um, and I ended up really really enjoying this book. I really liked both of the main characters. Um, I really liked the romance in this book and the way that the friendship turned into romance in a way that felt very natural and believable um, and this is coming from somebody who doesn't really like friends to lovers and another thing that I really loved about this book and probably one of my favorite parts is is how serious some of it was. I don't know why but when I was hearing about this book I thought it was mainly going to be a rom-com with the kind of backdrop of taking place during a campaign um, and it really wasn't. The campaign was really important and this book had so many wonderful things to say about politics and activism and uh, and doing the right thing. Um, it handles a lot of really topical issues like Islamophobia and anti-semitism and just the general political climate right now and I think it did that in a way that is very realistic but it's still hopeful. I just think that balance was really really well done. I think this is such an important book to read and to paraphrase a twitter thread from I think it was Molly Knox Ostertag, you are not going to get a candidate that you agree with on every point. Your job is to vote for the person who does the most good and the least harm and then to work to fix the parts that they don't do as well with. They said it much more eloquently than I did. I will actually try to link that thread before, below if I find it um, but I think this, that's something that really came through in this book is you're not going to get a perfect candidate. Your job is to choose the best option we have and to work to fix the rest and yeah it's like there, there are some parts of this book that just made me super emotional about that. Um, please vote y'all please vote. There were only a couple of things that I didn't like about this book so I'll get those out of the way now. This is the first thing that I have read by Becky Albertalli but I was interested in this because of the premise and also because I have read some things by Aisha Saeed before that I really loved and I definitely like her writing better than Becky Albertalli's. Like some of Becky Albertalli's writing is I really enjoyed like it was really funny and topical and the dialogue was really great but there were some parts where it was just like so unrelentingly quirky that it got really kind of annoying um I don't know so it was kind of I kind of went back and forth with how much I enjoyed the way she wrote but I did really enjoy Jamie who is the character that she was writing from just like the way that Albert Talley wrote sometimes I didn't really click with and another thing which is kind of related is the pop culture references I had mixed feelings about um Aisha Saeed used them too I know Albert Talley is kind of like known for doing those but Aisha Saeed did use some of them too some of them I loved and some of them I'm like the problem with pop culture references is if somebody doesn't love the reference you're making it can kind of color your feeling on a book so like for example there are multiple references to the office and these characters bonding over their shared love for the office and the office is one of my least favorite shows i have ever seen <laughs> which i know is like a super unpopular opinion i'm sorry you guys i watched the whole thing believe it or not yeah i really hate that show so when they were trying to do like cute or funny or endearing moments between them based on that i was kind of like I don't like this. Like, mm, not really working for me as well as some of their other scenes did, um, but that's a pretty minor complaint. And then the other issue I had with this book is some of the more interpersonal conflicts I think were not handled as consistently as other parts of the book. Like there were some things that came up at the very end of this book that I think were realistic conflicts to have, but the way that I think was unrealistic was the way that they weren't in the book at all until it was like the most dramatic moment possible <laughs> and then suddenly there were these huge issues that these characters had not indicated before um and that they hadn't talked about and hadn't even thought about before that which i know happens in real life but the way it was timed in this book just felt very contrived to me for like maximum drama and that kind of took me out of my enjoyment of this book a little bit and then as another example of a conflict i didn't really love is like the way jamie's stage fright is handled i thought felt a little bit like it was cured by him falling for Maya um, which is not a trope I enjoy and also I just I don't know it's kind of unclear like does Jamie actually have social anxiety or is he just does he just get nervous public speaking which is obviously not something to overlook that's still a really scary thing the fact that on top of it feeling a little bit like his girlfriend cured him of this on top of being like not really sure if this is anxiety and like something that he should you know look into treating or if it was just you know people don't like public speaking I thought that was a little maybe counterproductive as far as like a mental health discussion goes but all those complaints are like relatively minor compared to how much I loved this book. Um, I think this is such an important story. I just really loved it. I always picked this up and I'm like I'm gonna read a couple chapters and I ended up reading way more than a couple chapters so it was also really compelling. A great balance of cute stuff and serious stuff which is something I obviously love in my contemporaries so highly recommend Yes No Maybe So and I gave it four stars. Okay everybody so that was my hopefully not 
too long January wrap up. Who am I kidding? It's going to be a marathon. Please let me know if you have read any of these books, what you thought of them, or if you're going to pick any of them up. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!